Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Civilization VI Tutorials. Coming at you with, that's right, even more basics. Thank you so much for being here, guys. I've really enjoyed getting into the tutorial making business, and all the positive feedback I've gotten so far from this series means so much. So when I originally started making these basics tutorials, I had thought I'd be able to cover everything I wanted to in just two videos. But I kept adding things to the list, and when I was making the second episode, I began to realize there was no way I'd be able to get everything I wanted to into just one more video. So here we are. It's even more basics. Now before we get started, I just wanted to talk briefly about the future of tutorials here on the channel and what you can expect to see. This will indeed be the last of the basics tutorials for beginners, so going forward you'll see tutorials that cover a much more narrow focus on particular aspects of gameplay, ranging from intermediate topics through more advanced concepts, all the way up to expert DD level strats to help people play the game at its highest level. But that's for another day. Today we've got more stuff to talk about to make sure everyone feels comfortable booting up a game of Civilization VI. So let's get started. And we're going to start with the military side of the game. Now there are a lot of layers and elements to the combat aspect of this game. But we're not going to cover all of that here today. Today I just want you guys to be comfortable with the basics. And that's what we're going to talk about. So let's start by talking about the different classes of units. And we'll start down here at the bottom with ranged units. So we've got here a couple of archers, and I'll just show you real quickly. When you click on your archer, if you have the technology, the archer upgrades into a crossbowman, just like that. Now the archers actually start, you get the first class of ranged unit is actually the slinger, which only has a range of one and is a very rudimentary warrior level uh, ancient unit. And once you go from Slinger up to Archer, Archers go to Crossbowman, etc. through the promotion tree. Now the main benefit of ranged units is their ability to weaken your opponents from the back lines. If you click on one of these units, you'll actually see they have two different combat strengths. They have their range strength, which is in this case 25, and that's their offensive strength when they're actually shooting at an opponent. That's the strength they hit at. And of course they don't take any damage back because they're just shooting from range. Whereas they have a melee strength, which is their basically their defensive strength. So if any unit hits them, uh, like a, a melee unit or a cavalry unit or whatever, then this is what they defend at. So obviously you do not want these guys to be going up against their equivalent counterpart from that era because if they get hit, they're going to get damaged much, much more than their opponent. So always good to keep these guys up on hills, a couple tiles back. If you can get a line of two or three or four of them going in, a, in the right position around a city, as the opponent comes in, they can take shots, damage, or even kill some of the opposing units. And then your front line, your melee units, or whatever you've got in place, will be much will have a much easier time of finishing them off. So always good, particularly when you're playing a passive game where you're not interested in building a big military and going take on other people on, but you're worried about being attacked by others, ranged units are always the first and last place to go for protecting your cities. And as you can see here, the crossbowman, which is the next class up, has the same issue, melee 30, which is stronger than the archer, but the range strength is 40. So you always want them using the 40, by hitting others and not taking damage versus being hit and taking damage and generally being beaten because they have a lower overall strength compared to the units of that era. So that's ranged guys, that's it. Now, the next guys we wanna talk about are the melee units or melee, depending on how you like to say it. And these guys are generally what you would consider to be the most versatile units in the game. Um, this is, of course, the warrior that you would start out within, with at the very beginning of a game. The next upgrade class for it is the Swordsman. Upgrades like that. And they continue to go through to Musketmen and so on throughout the game. And they're, they're a very strong unit because, A, they get a combat bonus when fighting against opposing units that are anti-cavalry, like these ones above them. And there's no unit in the game that actually has a combat bonus against them. So... 
they're quite they're quite advantageous in that way. And the other thing that they have going for them is that they're the only unit, if you're playing under the Gathering Storm expansion rule sets, that can actually take advantage of the Siege Tower and Battering Rams for taking down cities with walls. Any other unit in the game, assuming you're playing under the Gathering Storm rules, don't actually work like that. Whereas if you're playing in a vanilla game, some of the other units do work like that. A little bit unrealistic, but that's what it is. If you're playing under Gathering Storm, like I said, this gives a really big advantage to the melee units and makes them very versatile uh, towards, you know, taking, uh, moving in towards taking down other people's cities. So that's really what they're really strong for. Now the next two types of units here we have are the cavalry units and the anti-cavalry units. So up here with, uh, on this on this row here, we've got horsemen and a couple of chariots. I'll just click on this chariot and show you that this guy upgrades into a knight, of course. And so here we have a knight, which is a much stronger medieval type unit. Um, you can see that their strength is a 48 compared to their predecessor, which is only a 28. And the difference between these units are the horseman upgrades into cavalry type units, which is which are the light cavalry class. And then these heavy chariots and the knights upgrade on the heavy cavalry class. Now, while they do have separate promotional trees going through different types of units, and they have a different promotional class as far as when they gain experience and promote themselves with different skill trees, the skill trees and the promotion classes are different, but they generally act in much the same way. And that is that they have uh, much higher movement movement levels. You can see here that this guy has four movement level, as does this guy. These guys, is a, the mid, this is the only three movement here because uh, this is the much earlier unit. But as you move along, they get more and more movement. And what makes the movement really handy is that these guys are really good at staying on the outside of the battle and flanking around your opponent to their back lines. And they're particularly useful at taking down the ranged units of your opponents, making it more safe for your melee units to move in with the support and surround a city to take it down. So the general idea is you have your cavalry units flank around the outside of a city. You can try and aim at some of their ranged units because the ranged units are what they're trying to use to injure your guys so they can't take your city. So you flank, hit the ranged units, your, your slower melee units, in with your support units, moving around the city much more safely. You take down the walls and then the city is yours. So that's the cavalry aspect. Now, of course, like I said, there is the anti-cavalry. The anti-cavalry actually got a combat bonus against the um, two different classes of cavalry, of, of course. That's the whole point of the name, anti-cavalry. And what makes them really good is if you can keep them kind of covering your own flanks, if your opponent does try to come around and, and attack your ranged units, if you have a couple of these guys in place, they actually get a combat bonus and they'll be able to take those guys down and, and keep them get them injured very quickly versus if you were fighting with melee strength units or, or just trying to shoot them with archers, which is not nearly as effective. So always good to see if you do have an opponent and you see them making lots of horse units or you, for, for instance, if you have a civilization you're going up against that you know makes lots of, of, of horse units, uh, cavalry units, then making sure that you're keeping up on your class promotions for your anti-cavalry units to defend your cities is definitely a good idea. Now, finally, the last type of unit we want to talk about is the support units. And the support units are essentially units that help you take down cities that have walls. And the first one that you're going to see is the battering ram, which starts off very early in the game. And it is only useful against cities that have the ancient walls. And an, and an example of a city that has ancient walls is London down here. You can see that they do have that blue bar in their health, meaning they do have walls. The green is the city, the blue is the, uh, the walls. And you can see that the walls are pretty rudimentary. They're basically just rough stone, just kind of stacked on top of one another. They don't have towers or anything like that. They're basically just doing their best to keep the most basic of forces out. Uh, now, it will make it so that if you are trying to hit this city with just basic units without any support, it will make it much more difficult and it'll, make it long, it'll take a lot longer to take down the walls themselves. 
but they're much more rudimentary and therefore the battering ram, which we see up here, is very useful. Now, if a city happens to have anything at walls that are uh, medieval or Renaissance, this no longer takes effect. The basic idea of the battering ram is that your melee units, when you're attacking the city, use all of their force to basically take the walls down versus if you don't have a battering ram, they don't have that instrument and they're essentially just trying to take the city and the walls prevent them. So they're doing much less damage to either the walls or the city and uh, being very ineffectual compared to if they have, if they're using the battering ram, which puts all their force into taking down the walls first. And if you have a few units, all, if you only have to have one battering ram next to the city and all the melee units that are adjacent to the city get credit for it. So if you have two or three swordsmen go to a city with ancient walls with a battering ram next to the city, one, two, three, you're, you're, you're going to take the walls down very quickly because that's their focus. All those guys are focusing on taking the walls down first and then they'll, they'll move on to the city once the walls are completely down. Now the, the converse of that is the siege tower. Now the siege tower actually works on both ancient walls and medieval walls. And Mitla here is an example of a city that has medieval walls. And you can see here, you can all, by the way, it does not, you don't have to look visually. It also tells you if you hover over the city, you can see it has ancient walls and medieval walls. So really it's just got the one, but uh, if you look at, you have to build ancient walls in order to be able to build, to build the medieval walls afterwards. Whereas if you were to look at the London city and you hovered over it, it would just say ancient walls. But you can see very clearly that these are much more refined walls. They have much more um, strength, obviously, when you look at them. They've got more refined stonework. They've got actual towers here. They're definitely something that are more well, much more well equipped to stop uh, attacks, including a battering ram, which essentially just wouldn't have the strength uh, to take down the city with these much more advanced walls. So that's why the battering room is ineffectual. And what you can do is if you have your siege tower and the melee units that come that you send with it, what happens is, is you put the siege tower next to the city and any city, any other unit that attacks the melee unit that attacks will also get credit for it. And what it is essentially doing, as you would imagine, is it's ignoring the walls and going over them with the siege tower. So they're basically, they pull the siege tower up you climb up the siege tower and you're right up on top of the walls and you're clearing it and heading the city. So what will eventually what will essentially happen is your units will ignore this blue bar and just start hitting uh, most of their power will all go directly to taking down the city. So once you once you do that and you hit with three or four units for a couple turns, the, you'll see the green bar go all the way down and eventually turn into yellow and red and, and go to zero, while the walls will have only taken just a little bit of damage. Um, and so you'll often just take the city before the walls are even down because you've gone over them. So that's the basic point of that. Now, beyond that, there are the bombard units. And these are the other kind of, they're not really support class. They're called, they're called bombard strength units. And you can see down here, they've got two strengths, just like the, um, the ranged units. You do not want these guys to get hit by cavalry or melee units or even anti-cavalry units because their melee strength is really really quite slow really quite low compared to their bombard strength which is meant entirely for uh hitting cities with walls so what you want to do you can see this is the catapult it would eventually upgrade into a bombard which is like a, a cannon unit and then that upgrades into artillery and stuff like that later in the game and they are designed specifically for one reason and one purpose and one purpose only and that is to hit walls and take them down before the rest of your units attack. And these units will actually, they'll have less effectiveness against higher strength walls, including the Renaissance walls, but they will do some damage directly to the walls and not to the city. So um, these units will hit the walls. If you have a bombard, it'll have more effect, obviously, and you can uh, knock down the Renaissance walls with bombards really quite quickly. One thing I will say is they are vulnerable to ranged attacks as well. So you'll often want to, if they have ranged attacks, they defend at their melee strength. You do not want these guys getting hit a lot. And they the AI does tend to focus their, their shots on trying to kill the bombard units or anything that can take down its walls. So 
what you're going to want to do is make sure their ranged units are killed. And when you move the bombards in, you're going to want to try and move two or three of them in often. So that if one is getting attacked, at least the other two are staying full strength. And they'll be able to get a couple shots in while the other one's getting hit. And you'll be able to take the walls down. Because um, they are very effective at taking down walls. Uh, it's just they, you need to kind of protect them and, and have a couple of them just to get their hits in quickly before they get worn down. So that's the basics of units, how they work and what they do and how they work against one another. So now that we've talked about the units and how they interact with one another, let's talk about a few basics of the combat itself and more specifically defensive or terrain bonuses and penalties, as well as attacking bonuses and penalties. As you can see here, we've gotten ourselves into a little bit of a skirmish with some barbarians, and this will provide us with the opportunity to take a look at some tactics and some of these buffs and debuffs you'll experience during combat. So, we've already actually encountered a couple of barbarians. We've actually killed one swordsman that was in this range here. We actually had this archer taking shots at it as it moved up, and it actually took a hit of its own. It is now in retreat, and but that is now dead. It, it died in a valiant attempt to attack this Mitla catapult, and did so failingly. But as you can see here, it's allowed us to use our cavalry units to move into flanking positions on some of their more vulnerable units and uh, do so while our other slower units move up towards the battle. And as you can see here, we have a crossbowman, which is very vulnerable to our much stronger knight units in a melee fight. So what I'd like to do is take a look at a couple things you can see here. First of all, when you hover over the fight, you can see obviously that we've got a much stronger unit, 55 to 33. But you can see that the crossbowman is taking a plus three ideal terrain bonus. And we'll talk about this throughout this conversation. But ideal terrain is essentially if you're standing on hills or in jungle or sorry, I always call it jungle rainforest or in the, uh, the, the woods, the trees and stuff like that you'll get this plus three ideal terrain bonus towards your defense versus the person attacking who doesn't get that buff. Now, what I want to do is I just want to move our guys into position here. And what I also want to do is talk about this unit up here. So again, when they're looking at this attack, this is actually a rather very even attack. 41 to 39 is what I would consider a very even attack. It's saying minor victory, but depending on the roll you get, you might actually take more damage than them. So... They have a 36 base strength, but you can see again, because he's standing on a hill, he's going to get the ideal terrain bonus. And I don't necessarily like that idea. Now we are getting our plus five bonus for the barbarian. Uh, we have the government card on that's giving us our plus five advantage versus barbarians. But again, it's 36 base versus 36 base. The bonuses are quite minor. But if we were to stand there and allow him to attack us or move into another position, say over here, where we're again, we're still standing on hills. When he does attack us, we will actually get that plus three ideal terrain bonus for standing on this hill while he attacks us. Instead of letting him have that bonus, it is often, very often the case when you're playing against the AI especially, to allow them to take the hits and you to take the fortification bonuses on hills and stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this guy into position over here. And the main reason I actually moved him over here, as opposed to just standing in place, is that now I am standing next to this crossbowman. And you may be like, well, you're standing next to him, but you're out of movement points, you can't hit him. That doesn't matter. Because what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, I'm going to click on one of these knights. And as you can see here, when I hover over top of this, you can now see that I have down there, in addition to the plus five advantage versus barbarians, I have a plus four for flanking bonus. And what's happening here is I get plus two for each unit I have adjacent to the unit I'm about to attack. So that's another plus four bonus. So 57 versus 33. It was already a really big win, but you should always take every last little bonus you can get because as you move on to further battles, you're, you're going to want to have as much strength and health as possible. And so if you were not to take these bonuses, you wouldn't get as much damage done against them and you'll take more damage yourself. And so you'll slowly take more and more damage as the battle goes on and eventually you'll you'll be running out of, of health and you'll need to retreat in order to heal up so the more advantages you can get in every single battle is always the most ideal situation so what we'll do is we'll take advantage of this we'll go ahead and hit this guy with this huge advantage and you can see here he took a huge minus 77 whereas we only took 13 health 
And then we can step in with this guy that we moved forward already. And we can take that one final hit, 57 to 25. It will be an absolutely crushing defeat. We just got a bonus there. Um, and you see, we only took 10 we only took 10 damage or so on this unit while finishing him off. So that's an advantage of having your cavalry move in very quickly and swarming their ranged units as fast as possible while you're moving into position with all your other units, like these guys. So, it's the next turn, and as you can see, the Barbarian Swordsman has chosen not to take on this fight with his horsemen because it is calculated that it would be a major defeat, and it does not want to take the opportunity to get absolutely murdered. Now, one might think, okay, well then we'll just go ahead and take the hit. But what I actually want to do here is not force that combat, but instead to have my cavalry units continue to push forward in an attempt to find more vulnerable units to attack, while our slower units and our ranged units move into counterattack positions uh, in this terrain and behind this river so that they can deal with this swordsman on their own. So what I would do is I would have my horsemen move forward and whenever it's possible I try to step onto hills to get the biggest uh, uh, range of view. If I were to step on this low piece of land here I'd only have one movement cost left and I wouldn't be able to step on any of the hills around me and so I'd literally be just stuck there on that floodplains to the end of the turn. So I step up here, that way I can see all the way out to here, whereas if I was standing here I couldn't. Now I know what's going on. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like this barb hut has really spawned as many units as I was hoping it had. So I can continue to move forward, like I said, and see what's going on here. Now, I don't need to worry about hitting that guy right now. He's an extremely weak uh, unit, so I'm just going to keep moving forward with my units like this. Because, uh, like I said, it's not really... This guy is going to die one way or another. He's extremely weak. I'm not worried about him. Um, so these guys have moved forward. Like I said, there's not units forward here. Like I was hoping there'd be like maybe some archers or, or crossbowmen that we could continue to take advantage of. But that's fine. This is still the strategy that you would want to use. And like I said, we're going to move our units into positions where it's advantageous. Now, for this guy here, I'm going to have him just heal in place to get a little bit of uh, health back. And I'm going to move this swordsman forward choosing to stand on the tree tile where I would get a combat bonus and not on the marsh where I'd actually get a combat debuff. So if someone would attack me here, I would actually have a decrease on my military strength or my melee strength because standing in marsh is actually a bad thing. So right here, if, the, if this unit, now this unit may attack this this catapult, but if it, were to, if it were to come to here, I would be in position to be able to fortify and have him attack me across this river if he wanted to. Plus if he steps here, I would be able to attack with this unit. And we'll also move this unit forward to get into position. Whenever possible, I try to step onto good terrain, which is hills in particular for vision. Now this, this ranged unit's a little bit forward in the combat, but we know that we're really safe. As long as he's not vulnerable to attack, you always want to keep moving them forward. And again, we're just moving our guys forward into position as I, we take advantage at the, at the front of the, of the combat field here we move into position to counterattack anything that's left over and straggling. Once again, we have clicked next turn and we are presented with some more opportunities to display some different combat scenarios. So the first one I wanted to show you is up here with this horseman. Now, when I go to click on this the attack here, you can actually see instead of being 4139 like it was last time, it is actually a stalemate at 41 to 41. And the reason why is it, it now has what is called a support bonus. So it works much like the uh, flanking bonus did in the previous example, but in this case, it's me attacking one of their units while it has a unit of its own in a supporting role adjacently. So you can see here, even if I, if I hover over the scout, it also gets that support bonus because it has a unit there. Okay, so if, if there happened to be, for instance, another one of their units here, and I try to attack this scout, it would actually get a plus four support bonus. So that is the basically the reverse or the opposite of the flanking bonus is the support bonus. So you can see here you could do that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ignore that and just move on. And the other thing I wanted to show you in this particular scenario is the, the, the bonuses that the anti-cavalry get against cavalry. So if I click on this knight here and I hover over the potential battle, it is a major victory, 54 to 44. But... If you take a look there, there's a couple things you need to see. First of all is the fortified defense bonus of plus six. So fortification works like this. 
essentially what happens is if you stay locked in position with full movement for an entire turn, meaning you have a turn, you have full movement, and you decide to stay in place, whether it's to heal or to skip turn or fortify, whatever you want to call it. If you stay in position for that full turn, then you will get what is called a fortification bonus. And the first stage is plus three fortification. So if you're in position for that whole turn and you get attacked, you get a plus three bonus for fortification. Now, if you were to stay there for another full turn, meaning the next turn comes up and you do not move at all, you don't promote, you don't do anything, you just stand there healing or standing in position, whatever, fortification, at that point, you will get plus six fortification defense like you can see the spearman has because this spearman's been here for many many turns once he's there for enough turns he gets that plus six so in addition to that plus six he's also got a plus 10 combat strength and that's for being against a cavalry unit because he's anti-cavalry now in this case it's it's helping him a lot but it's not helping him quite enough because he is a spearman and a spearman is an ancient era unit that is way outclassed by this medieval knight unit he's basically two ears behind in technology so it's the base strength of 48 versus 25 is an extreme example but if you take a look at the technology tree for a moment and you look at the pikeman which is the equivalent class or equivalent equivalent era class of unit for pikeman uh, anti-cavalry unit it has a base strength of 41 versus the base strength of a 48 against a heavy cavalry unit knight so, if you consider that 41 versus 48 instead, when you come back here, if this was a pikeman, which the next time we run into a barbarian hut, it may very well be, if you look at that actual number, the base strength would then be 41. When you add in the 3 and the 6, that turns it into a base, that turns it into a 50, add in the plus 10 for being an anti-cav, and that would actually be a strength of 60 combat strength that we'd be hitting into so we'd have we'd still have 54 against a 60 so we'd actually be taking a bit of a loss now being able to hit with a couple guys he would take a fair amount of damage we could hit again maybe heal up with a promotion or something like that you could still probably win this battle but just imagine that difference without that plus 10 combat strength it would be 54 versus 50 but because they get that pike when we get plus 10 it would be 54 against 60 and it actually be a significant loss so that's a very important thing to keep in mind when you're attacking units is what is the scenario it would actually be much more advantageous for these knights to leave this behind and it would be better to have a couple swordsmen or something like that hit it because the swordsman when the swordsman attacks the plus 10 combat strength versus against cavalry would actually disappear Okay, one final combat scenario that I wanted to show you guys before we wrapped up the military aspects that we we're going to cover in this video. And that is the old river bonus. So if I click on my swordsman and see what's going to happen here in this combat scenario, you'll actually see that their swordsman is actually getting what is called a bonus 5 river defense. So in addition to getting the ideal terrain for standing on that hill, and he's got the support bonus because he's got a unit adjacent, He's getting a plus 5 river defense. So I'm actually going to get a major defeat here of 41 to 46. So I don't want to do that. So my choice can be to actually get into better position to defend from instead. To the point where he may actually choose not to take the battle again because he will recognize a major defeat himself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this pikeman into position on this hill where he will also get a bonus. And he's also much, much strong. He's got a 41 strength versus this... 36 and so these two together will be able to give each other flanking bonus and what will happen is, is if I stand here this unit as you can see has full movement so if I click on fortify then when I click next turn this unit will actually get a, a bonus because uh, he will have gotten that plus three fortification for having a full turn go by with him not moving if I did it again for another turn, it would then become plus six. So that's what we want to do. Now, what I want to do next is I want to hit shift enter and, and we're going to hope that he tries to attack us and you'll see the kind of damage he deals. And you can actually see that again, they chose not to attack because we've got such a strong position. Now, if you were playing against not the barbarians, but against another civilization and they were trying to attack you, 
then they would be much more aggressive in trying to move forward and, and, and kill you. The barbarians tend to take a much more cautious approach. Now, in this case, this guy's moved into a position where he is extremely vulnerable. He's got the minus two unfavorable terrain because he's standing on floodplains. Floodplains and marsh both give that negative uh, unfavorable terrain, as you can see. And I'll be able to go ahead and hit him. And that one shot from that archer kills him instantly. The crossbowman could have also done the same thing. Uh, what I could continue to do is move forward. Now, because this guy doesn't want this battle, we might as well just continue to move forward. So we'll move our units into position. We're actually going to be able to do a very good job of injuring this guy with this crossbowman. Because we have our crossbowman strength of plus 5 for a promotion of volley, plus 5 for barbarians. So we're actually hitting him at 50. And he's going to take a 37 strength defeat. And yeah, I could also hit there. Uh, like I said, I continue to move forward. But we've basically covered all, I believe we've covered all of the different combat bonuses and, and debuffs and stuff that you get based on terrain and how you attack, when you don't attack, when you're defending, how to get fortification, uh, as well as like anti-cav versus cavalry, stuff like that. So hopefully this clears up some of the basics of combat and you guys will have a really good understanding when you move forward into your next game on how to attack, when to defend, and when you're going to get your bonuses and not. Alright, so the next thing I'd like to talk to you guys about is religion. Now I'm not going to go into the weeds on all the different beliefs and the best way to create a religion based on the different game style that you might be playing. Once again, I just want to focus on making sure you guys understand the basics. But before I get it, before I get into that, I just want to remind everyone how it is that you acquire a great profit that you need to found a religion. The primary method of getting yourself a great profit is through the accumulation of great profit points, which you get through the construction of holy sites, as well as the buildings that go inside them. Beyond that, you can also do holy site prayers once you've constructed a uh, shrine within your holy site. Now, you don't always have to do the prayers. The prayers, um, what happens is when you do a prayer and you complete the prayer, which takes sometimes, depending on the production of your city, four, five, six turns, or sometimes more, uh, you'll get a lump sum of great profit points that will go towards accumulating what you need to get the great profit. Now, unless you're playing on the higher difficulty levels, it is pretty rare that you actually do need to do the prayers. Typically, if you get a holy site and a shrine and you keep an eye on the scoreboard, you should be pretty good. Uh, on the lower difficulty levels for getting a great profit unless you wait super late into the game and some of them are already gone and it's maybe you can keep an eye on the, the race up here and the great profit you can keep an eye on uh, who's got how many points and if you're behind and you feel like you're not going to get it then you can make the decision to actually do a prayer or two in order to push yourself ahead. Now that's the primary method. The other way that you can acquire a great profit is by constructing the Great Wonder Stonehenge. Stonehenge, if there is a Great Prophet left when it's constructed, which there should be unless somebody waits super late to actually build it, which is rarely the case when you're playing against the AI, uh, the Great Wonder uh, Stonehenge gives you a free Great Prophet, which you can use to establish a religion. So, with that said, we've covered that off. Let's talk about the actual religion constructing. So when you go up here to the religion tab, you can actually see on a standard map, there's five slots for religions and you can see four of them are already constructed. We have our profit available to make the fifth religion. And when you click on any of these, it'll start to tell you the different beliefs that they have. And you can see that there's four slots here. Now the AI always chooses, uh, they always start by getting their follower belief, which is like the, the basis of the religion. And then they always will get their building. Uh, also known as their worship belief. So that's where they the, the building that they can construct within their holy sites as a tier three building where you would do the worship and get the benefits that correspond to it. Again, I'm not going into all the details, just so you understand. So in order to show you a little bit more closely, let me just take my great prophet, step onto our holy site where you can actually found your religion and click like that. And then we're going to choose religion. So in here, you can make your choice on symbol, and of course, in my community, it's Beardism or a Noism. So Beardism it is. Now, like I said, right up front, this right here is where you choose your follower belief. This is like the basis of your religion. Jesuit education can be very handy 
I'm not going to go through all of them. Choral music also very good. For now, I'm just going to choose Jesuit education. Now, you should also know that Jesuit education, or whatever your follower belief is, along with your prayer building, are the two things that the two beliefs that your civilization can give to other civilizations essentially so if you are an, if you don't have a religion or even if you do have a religion your cities can take on the follower belief as well as the worship belief so if you have a city that do, whether you've founded a religion or not that actually follows this other religion then they will be impacted by the the per, like jesuit education or whatever choral music whatever the belief is here as well as the building that they can actually construct as their tier three building. The other two locations here, the enhancer belief and the founder belief. So these here are the founder beliefs with the book. And then these are the enhancer beliefs. These two only ever impact the founding member, the founding civilization of that religion, no matter even if the other religion or the other civilization follows that religion completely, it doesn't matter. Okay. So simply put, You've got your original belief that you choose, and then you've got your building your building that you can build within your sites, your holy sites. Uh, then you've got your founder beliefs here, which typically enhance the impact of people following your religion. So extra science, extra gold, extra religion, uh, extra culture, stuff like that. And then the, the, the bottom one down here, the enhancer belief, does just what it sounds like it would it enhances the abilities of the people following that religion so it can get you a defender of the faith so extra combat strength when you're in your territory or a crusader holy order is very good missionaries and apostles cost 30 percent less so it basically enhances your ability to spread your religion or enhances your ability to defend your religion is essentially what those enhancers do and again those are only uh, applicable to the people who are actually uh, founded the religion itself along with these guys okay so for now it doesn't really matter what you choose uh or what i choose here again i'm going to do an entire tutorial on religion in the future that will break down all the different beliefs and the best ways to choose a religion based on the kind of victories you're going for but for now if you're not actually going for religious victory tith is a pretty decent one we'll just go ahead and hit that one and found this religion okay folks so there is just a couple more topics to cover here today the next topic I'd like to discuss is where to find information within the game, particularly useful information. So the first thing that you should know about, in case you don't already, is up here in the top right corner you can see a little question mark which opens up the Cephalopedia. And within here you are going to find pretty much all the information you could ever imagine. So if you're the kind of person who enjoys reading and, and searching for the answers to questions that you might have then this is pretty well done, I must say. You've got the civilizations, the leaders, city-states, districts, buildings, all the different aspects of the game are built are put in right up here at the top. And then each time you click on any particular topic, it breaks down on the left-hand side here the different things. So you've got wonders, and then you can just search for the wonder you want like that. So you can start to leaf through that, or you can go into the projects, and it talks about all the different projects you can do. And another thing you can do is just go in here to the search bar and type in what you're looking for and the information will pop up. So if this is the kind of thing you like to do and you want to spend the time, there's all kinds of information that can be found in here, particularly if you're stumped about a certain question that you haven't found the information to. Next is, just below that, the list of reports. Now, not necessarily all of these reports are going to be useful to everybody. Some people may not like them. Some people may love it. If you're the type of person who enjoys looking at charts, then this one could be the one for you. Under the yields tab, it basically breaks down every city in your empire and all of the yields that it's acquiring across the board here, production, food, gold, faith, science, culture, and eventually tourism, of course. And that's basically it. You've got all the breakdowns. It tells you exactly how you're doing it. So from work to tiles, from amenities, from the palace and here and the capital. So all of these different things shows you just how you're getting all the different gold, food, whatever that each city gets. So when you're starting out in the game and you're trying to figure out where all the numbers are coming from, if this is the kind of thing that this chart looks like something you could see yourself perusing, then there's a lot of information here to be found, including down here at the bottom, the four accumulative numbers that are important to you that you see up here in the left-hand corner. This is where those numbers uh, get totaled 
city by city. Just like that. Now the next tab over is resources. And I, I wouldn't say I use this one particularly often, but it can be occasionally useful to look up which luxuries you're currently getting and also keep an eye on how your strategics are going. Uh, in particular, you can see here, if you look at any particular luxury, for instance, it can show you where you've got those and also where you're getting them from as far as city-states. So you've got a couple of suzerain city-states that are giving you furs. And in addition, I've got a couple cities that have one of their own. So I've got a total of four furs right now, which you could if you wanted to trade away. So it's good to keep an eye on that. Down here, you can see we have the salt. We are currently importing it from Philip, but you can also see that we're also getting it from Taruga, uh, the city-state that we're suzerain of. So we know that when this runs out in four turns, we no longer need to get the salt from Philip because we're getting it for free from the city-state. And of course, as you know, only the first copy of any luxury matters. All right. So it could be a pretty handy little screen sometimes uh, to look up your luxuries and stuff. But for the most part, I don't usually use it a whole lot, but it's up to you. And finally, I wanted to take a quick look here at city status. We've looked at this before, but I, I click on this quite often to see this, the status of all of my cities as far as happiness is concerned. Because if your cities are ecstatic, like these three cities here are, then they're getting 10% bonus to all the yields. And if they're happy, it's 5%. And of course, like I've mentioned in the previous videos, uh, if you're three higher than the requirement, so six over three or five over two, then you're ecstatic. If you're one or two over the requirement, that makes you happy. Anything beyond three over is still just ecstatic. So keeping an eye on this and knowing if you're getting the bonuses or not is extremely important concept to make sure you're keeping an eye on. And the other thing I wanted to show you real quick, and I think I've brought it up a couple times uh, and shown it during these videos, but when you click on a city, there is a toggle city details button right here in the top left. So when you click this, it's going to break down the basics of each city. And this is basically just another way of looking at the information that's in some of the other reports, but Sometimes it helps you understand exactly what's happening. So amenities growth bonus, you're getting 20% because the city's ecstatic. Uh, you can see the food per turn and the consumption per turn. And it basically breaks down all the food that's uh, going through that one city. Same thing down here with amenities. It breaks down what you're getting, where you're getting it from, and how many you need, stuff like that. So shows your ecstatic status. And then, of course, your housing situation as well, where you're getting your housing from. And uh, so you have nine housing, you can see here. And so you, you can see the, the impact of having uh, eight citizens in a nine housing city is a 50% reduction in growth rate. So pretty straightforward information there. But again, like I said, it can be useful to take a look at that and, uh, and know what you're going on, what's going on there. And then the other thing I wanted to show you real quick is if you go into, here to world rankings, you've got all the information about uh, all the different victory conditions okay so you've got overall in here you have science victory culture victory domination victory religious victory it shows you the basic leaderboard of those different statuses and then you can go into score and if you click on details here it opens it up and it shows you all of the different ways in which your empire scores or your total score is being accumulated so your your number of civics uh, that you've teched your empire score which is your cities plus your districts uh your great people points that are the great people uh score you've gotten your religious score uh the points you get from technology and of course points from wonders which is five points per wonder so this is basically how the it's tabulated so that 197 versus 169 and so on this gives you the breakdown of the information there sometimes it's not really all that important but sometimes you might want to know where is that number coming from that's where you're going to find it and then, like I said, you come down here, the, There's this is the science screen for victory. This is the culture screen for victory, domination, and religion. And in just a couple moments, I will break down the basic concept of how you win each of these four different victories. And then again, like I said, this is the overall uh, perspective for each one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as we draw this third and final basics tutorial video to a close, I thought it would be appropriate to take some time and talk about how exactly you win a game of Civilization VI. So, once again, going up in here to our World Rankings tab, you will see all the stuff that we just, uh, I just showed you. There's the overall tab, which breaks down the four major winning conditions and what your place is in each of those. 
There's the score tab, which is generally less important because generally a game's not going to go to the end of the 500 turns or whatever speed you're playing on to make the score count, but you can win a score victory and that's where you'd find that information. The four major victory conditions of the game are science, culture, domination, and religion. So let's start with the first one here, which is science. Now, the main thing to keep in mind here with science is that the victory conditions are actually different in the base game versus if you're playing with expansions. If you're playing in the base game, there's three stages to a science victory. The first one is to research rocketry, build yourself a spaceport, and launch an Earth satellite. Uh, then you need to research satellites, which allows you to launch the moon landing. And then you need to do three separate researches within the tech tree at the end of the tech tree in order to launch the three pieces of the Mars exhibition. So there it is. Just It's all about get your science research up, going through the tech tree, getting the appropriate technologies you require in order to launch these uh, different expeditions, including the Mars expedition, which has three parts. Now, if you are playing with expansions and not the original game, then there's actually five parts. The first and second part are actually the same. The third part, instead of having to launch three different or three different parts to the expedition, the Mars expedition itself is just one actual project. But then beyond that, there's a fourth and fifth stage. The fourth stage requires you to launch a spaceship, essentially, which is going into outer space and to travel to a new world. And that spaceship needs to travel 50 light years and you go forward one light year every turn as a base. So the fifth stage of science victory is to basically travel those 50 years and you can speed up that by using laser projects which you essentially magically point the lasers at the um, spaceship which is traveling at many light years per, per turn and you do these projects inside your spaceports to speed up how fast you're traveling. And the faster you travel, the less turns it's going to take for you to get to that 50 turn uh, level. So, like I said, there's it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty much a straight line through science, whether you're playing with the three stages of the base game or the five stages of, of the expansion. If you hover over the, the stages, it tells you exactly what you need to know uh, to get through to the next step uh, in the process. So that's a science victory. Quickly, going over to culture victory. Not nearly as straightforward as a science victory. This is one of the, the victory conditions, or the victory condition I hear the most questions about exactly how it works. It could be pretty complicated, and I'm not going to try to overwhelm you. I'm just going to give you the basic idea of what it's saying here, and how it translates to this section down below. Essentially, there's two kinds of tourists. There's tourists that are domestic, and there's tourists that are visiting. Okay, so when you come down here, you're going to see each civilization is listed and they have a number corresponding to the color that their civilization is, which indicates their number of domestic tourists. And domestic tourists are essentially um, people who want to stay inside their own country or their own civilization because they enjoy it there because of the high culture and tourism that exists. If you, if somebody else is, essentially, if somebody else has better culture and tourism, a, a member of another civilization is going to likely want to leave their own civilization and go visit with another civilization. And that's where the second column comes in here, the visiting tourists. And what you need to do in order to win a culture victory is have more visiting tourists, total visiting tourists from all other civilizations, than any other civilization within the game has domestic tourists. So you can see here with each number indicated here, the highest number is Teddy Roosevelt right now, who has 32 domestic tourists. So you can see over here that everybody else in the game has a requirement of a 33, which would be more than 32. So once anybody right now had more tourists visiting their civilization from other civilizations than the 32 that Teddy has, meaning 33, then you get the victory. So 2 out of 33 obviously isn't very close. Eventually this number will keep going up, because more as the game goes on, people are going to have more and more people staying and, and being becoming domestic tourists. So the bigger this number gets, the longer it takes to win. So your question is, okay, how do I get people to visit my lands versus staying home and creating this number being higher? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's not, there's lots of different ways to create tourists, people wanting to come to your land. The first thing is you need to create 
uh, you start creating the theater squares and the buildings that go inside them. Once you start doing that, you'll get the great people points, which works towards your writers, your artists, and your musicians. Those great works are going to attract people to your lands. People want to come and see those great works of writing, those great works of art. They want to hear those great works of music, that kind of stuff. So that will attract tourism in. The more tourism you're generating, the more likely people will come to your land. Other ways that you can create tourism as the game goes on are through seaside resorts, through, uh, through national parks, and also if you're playing in the um, later version of the game with expansions, there you can do stuff like having rock bands and things like that. And so the, again, it's all about creating more tourism. The more tourism you're generating, the more culture you have, the more likely people want to come to your lands versus staying home. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a complex situation. It's not an easy thing to describe. There's different ways that you can drive your tourism up. For instance, having trade routes with other civilizations, having open borders with other civilizations. There's also policies you can get later in the game through the civics tree that will increase and improve your level of tourism. And yeah, you just have to keep an eye on the different technologies, the different civics, and create as much culture as you can, create as much tourism as you can, get as many great works as possible into your amphitheaters and your museums and stuff like that. And that's how you push towards that victory. Again, not easy, not straightforward, not simple to understand. But after you've tried it a few times and you've focused on all the things I've talked about here, it'll start to become more apparent what's working and what doesn't. Now, moving on. Domination victory. So the basic concept of domination victory is for you as a civilization to have possession of every original capital of every other civilization at one time. So you have to have the capital of all the other people in the game. You can see here we've already gotten rushes because we took them over and took their capital. So that's that's one captured. And then you'd have to capture the capital of every other civilization in order to actually get a domination victory. The moment you take that last capital, you've achieved domination victory. And finally, there's the religious victory. The religious victory is pretty similar to a domination victory in terms of you need to dominate all other civilizations with your religion but instead of it being you have to possess the capital or have the capital of every other civilization following your religion it's actually just the majority of cities that a civilization has have to be following your religion so as you can see here harold has got teddy and himself following protestantism so more than half the cities uh, within the United States actually has, uh, is following the religion Protestantism, which was founded by Harold. So he's got two of them following it. But he'd have to get every other civilization in the game. Not just all the civilizations that founded a religion themselves, but all the civilizations that did not found a, found a religion as well. So once every once you've achieved that, and it can happen where you've got, you'll have the majority in one civilization and you'll move on to another one you get the majority there you got the majority in the next one and then next thing you know you're almost done and you realize that one of the city civilizations that you already took over actually is no longer following your religion you might have to backtrack and go get them as well so it's a it's a bit of a min max kind of moving units around and and spreading your religion as fast as possible and and consuming all other cities as fast as possible to have them following your religion and once you've got all seven or all five or however many other civilizations there are in the game uh, following your religion then you will achieve the religious victory so that's it folks that's the basics of civilization six my hope is that after watching these three tutorial videos players who are new to the game or have been struggling with the game can take the information they've learned here and start a brand new game of civilization six with confidence. And don't forget, the tutorials don't end here. This is merely the beginning. More tutorials we'll be releasing on a regular basis that will cover a wide range of topics to help improve your knowledge and skill level in the game. And you can help influence which topics I cover next by leaving some comments down below. I have a big list of things I want to cover, but choosing what comes next isn't easy. So start a discussion, leave those comments, and let me know what you want to see. And also, of course, it really does mean a lot to me when you take the time to hit that like button 
and help spread the word to others around YouTube. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel as well so you don't miss any of the Civilization VI content that's posted daily. All right, that's it. That's all I've got. I've got nothing else for you. Take care of yourselves, folks, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.